Alright, welcome to Astronomy 101 at McKendry University. This is a recorded lecture for Thursday, January 31st, 2013, while I am on my move. Um, so how this is going to work, it's just a video, so you can watch this, play it, stop it, rewind, whatever you need to do. Um, and essentially it's just going to be our lecture that we normally would have had on Thursday in our online live classroom, but instead it's just a video. So to start off with today, I want to start with the concept question, reviewing what we covered last time in class on Tuesday. So going back to our understanding of lunar phases, okay, lunar um, orientation around our sun and whatnot. So when the moon is between the sun and the earth, what do we see? Okay, so take a minute and think about this. The moon, think about the orientation, maybe the bird's eye view. The moon is between the sun and the earth. Do we see a full moon, a lunar eclipse, a new moon, or a lunar phase of waxing gibbous? <clears throat> what do you guys think? So the moon is between the sun and the earth. Alright, so hopefully you all answered new moon, answer C. <clears throat> so if you take a look at this, the new moon, okay, here's our nice bird's eye view that you've seen in the textbook in our lecture slides before. New moon is when the moon is between us and the sun, right? So the sun is illuminating the back side of the moon, therefore we're seeing the quote-unquote dark side or the shadowed side of the moon, which is what we see as the new moon, right? When it's, it's dark appearing to us. The opposite side, when we are between the moon and the sun, is when we have the potential to see a full moon, or what we'll talk about today is the potential to see a lunar eclipse. Okay. So I got a little confused, but we have already talked about lunar eclipses. So what we're talking about today is scientific revolution. Okay, so we're diving into chapter four in our textbook. And today what we're going to talk about is we'll essentially jump into more, you know, who were the first scientists that saw all these phenomena, right? So we, we observe the lunar phases, we can see lunar eclipses. But what about even just our understanding of our own solar system, the geometry of the sky? What did the ancients see, and how did they interpret, interpret our universe and our solar system? So we're going to cover what's called the geocentric versus heliocentric models. We're going to cover Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, which really were the first outline of how our solar system works. We'll briefly talk about Galileo and his invention of the telescope. I want to go over Newton's laws of physical motion, which essentially guide our motion on Earth um, as well as in the heavens. Um, looking at Newton's fourth law of motion, the universal law of gravitation, and a little bit about tides. So that's what we're going to cover today in Chapter 4 on the Scientific Revolution. Alright, so <clears throat> to start out, for much of human, human history, people believed that everything revolved around the Earth. Okay, so this, for a long time, it was really thought, which is not too hard to believe, right, that everything revolved around us, right? We look at the stars, and it appears to us that the stars are moving around the Earth, even though we now know that it's the Earth that is rotating. It's pretty easy to see how the ancients would think, well, everything's revolving around us. Okay, so they believed in a universe in which everything revolves around a stationary Earth. This is called the Earth-centered universe, or geocentric universe, geo being Earth. So most Greek scholars of their time believed in this geocentric universe. And this view was formally put together by Aristotle. Okay, he was kind of the main guy that put this all together. So what did you see in this geocentric universe that the Greeks thought um, was how our solar system existed? So they saw five planets, our sun and our moon, and then the stars, which they thought were fixed out in this outer sphere. Okay, so they, they viewed the Earth as being the center of the universe, with our moon revolving around the Earth, then Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then all those infinite stars kind of fixated on this outermost sphere. So notice that they were only able to see these five planets, okay, because these are the brightest planets in our sky. The other planets that we know of today are just really too faint to see with your naked eye. So everything in this case for these Greeks at this time in the geocentric universe, we're looking at planets that were visible with the naked eye. The geocentric universe was held for quite some time, but one of the problems, it was hard to explain the motions of the planets. Okay, so they were able to see these five visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. But the planets move, according to the background stars, a little bit different. 
So over the course of one night, a planet is going to move with the background stars, just as the moon moves with the background stars, moving from the east to the western sky. But from night to night, okay, week after week, month after month, the planets appear to wander in the night sky, meaning they appear to move backwards across those stationary constellations, those stationary stars. So each night, the planet moves further and further to the east, but periodically, it's going to slow down and then reverse direction, wandering in a sense, before it resumes back into its e regular eastward motion. <clears throat> okay, so from night after night, so imagine you looked at the stars night after night, you would notice the planets move relative to the background stars. And in general, they move eastward. Okay, so you can imagine night after night, this, the planets will move eastward along the sky relative to the background stars. But then now and then, they do this wandering motion where they start to wander back westward and then turn around again and then wander relative to the background stars in this eastward direction again. When the planets turn and start moving back westward, we call this retrograde motion. So this is the wandering of the planets, okay? So relative to the background star, so here are these constellations measured by the blue lines here. Okay, relative to background stars, month after month, the planets are going to move eastward. Okay, eastward is to the left here, relative to the background star. So if you were looking at these constellations, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, month after month, you'd notice a planet, let's say Mars, moving eastward relative to these background constellations but then it appears to wander, meaning that the planet moves in a retrograde motion, heading back westward, then turns around again, back on its regular motion, okay, moving back eastward. That's the wandering of the planets. Okay, we see this happening in the night sky, and the ancient Greeks were seeing this happen. But now, the ancient Greeks of Aristotle's time believed in the geocentric universe an Earth-centered universe, an Earth-centered solar system. So how then can this be explained? How can this wandering of the planets be explained using the geocentric model for the planets? Okay, so <clears throat> in the geocentric model, a scientist, um, Ptolemy, published some work explaining this wandering of the planets in this geocentric model. And how he did this was he used what are called epicycles. So he said, okay, not only are the planets orbiting around the Earth at the center of our universe here, but they are also moving in small circles as they orbit around the Earth. And these small circles is what he called an epicycle, okay, a small circular orbit around some imaginary point. So he said, okay, as Mars or as Jupiter or as Saturn are orbiting around Earth in this geocentric view, they are also going around some imaginary point in an epicycle. So then you can imagine if they're going around in a circle and orbiting around the Earth, from our point of view, it would appear that the planets wander or do this kind of little loop-de-loop -loop motion. And so Ptolemy used this idea of this epicycle motion, this epicycle orbit, to explain the wandering of the planets, to explain retrograde motion in the geocentric view. Here's another view of these epicycles that Ptolemy envisioned, where an orbit around the Earth, okay, with the, which he called a different, and then this epicycle motion, oops, this epicycle motion, where each planet is orbiting around some imaginary point. But here's the problem. What are these planets orbiting around? The only reason, okay, for example, the moon orbits around our own Earth is because there's a gravitational attraction. The Earth is tugging on the moon, pulling it into orbit. Well, in this case, what is pulling on these planets to make it go along and around in this epicycle as it orbits the Earth in the geocentric view? This was really the failing point of the geocentric model because scientists realized that there's really no reason why planets would move in an epicycle. There's no point here to have this planet be gravitationally orbiting around some nothingness of a point. So this really threw the geocentric model out the window. And it came to the recent view, which was first in favor by the scientist Aristarchus, 
that maybe instead of everything revolving around the Earth, all planets revolve around our Sun instead. Okay, so Aristarchus was the first one to really favor this view, and then the scientist Nicholas Copernicus really expanded on this view. But so what does this mean? So Aristarchus said maybe instead the universe is sun-centered. We call that heliocentric, meaning all five planets that they could visually see, including the Earth, orbit around our sun. Okay, and then our moon orbiting around us, and then us orbiting around the sun. That's just called the heliocentric view of the universe. And this heliocentric view is the view we now have of our solar system. Okay, not the whole universe, but our solar system. Now what's neat is from this new heliocentric universe view that Aristarchus had, they were able to determine from geometry and trigonometry the relative sizes of the sun, moon, and the earth. So they really started to have a more comprehensive view of our solar system. Now, Copernicus is the one that came along and said, okay, this heliocentric view really makes a lot of sense. Let's see if we can explain this wandering retrograde motion of the planets with the heliocentric view. So Copernicus was the one that explained that retrograde motion can be explained as a result of the difference in time for planets to rotate around the sun. Okay, what does this mean? Well, planets close to the sun orbit the sun faster because they are being gravitationally pulled by the sun a lot stronger. Planets farther from the sun are going to orbit the sun at a lot slower of a rate. So this difference in the speed of rotation, meaning how long it takes a planet to orbit the sun, is going to cause objects to appear to wander in the night sky. So let's start with Earth and Mars, for example. So Earth takes 365 days to orbit around our sun, right? One year. Mars is further out from the sun than Earth. Okay, so if we have the sun, then we have Earth, and then Mars is further from the sun than Earth is from the sun. Mars takes almost twice as long to orbit the sun as the Earth does, meaning that it takes longer for Mars to go around the sun. It moves slower. So then, from the Earth's point of view, okay, as we're orbiting around our sun and we see Mars, okay, let's start on the right-hand side of the image here, okay, the first little orbit here of Earth. We see Mars. From our point of view, relative to the background stars that really don't move, okay, we see Mars being somewhere over here. Now, we continue in our orbit around their sun, so does Mars, but we are moving faster than Mars. So now, when we've moved in our orbit, let's say a month later, we look at Mars, and now Mars appears to have shifted relative to the background stars because we are literally overtaking Mars's orbit. Now, we overtake completely Mars's orbit because we're moving faster. We look at Mars, and geez, Mars appears to be way over here relative to the background stars. Until finally we move on farther along our orbit and Mars will appear to continue eastward again. So this wandering or retrograde motion of the planets in the night sky is really due to the fact that we are surpassing planets in our orbit around the sun. So the larger the retrograde motion we see, that means that the planet is going to be closer to Earth. Okay, the farther they get, the smaller this retrograde motion that we'll see. So let's take a look at this good video here, which clearly explains retrograde motion. All right, here we go. There's not really any audio to this, so I'll kind of read through it with you. Okay, so most of the time, the planets move gradually through the stars from west to east like the sun. Okay, so here's Mars, the little red dot. It takes about two Earth years to orbit the sun, okay? Earth goes a lot quicker. Look at how fast we move around our sun compared to Mars. Okay, opposition. Okay, this is when we get super close to, to Mars. Okay, when we get close in our orbit, here we come on up in opposition, the planet will appear bigger. Alright, so here comes the retrograde motion. How do we see Mars relative to these background stars on the left? Okay, here we are. Look at how the blue dot Earth is moving relative to the red dot Mars and how we see Mars relative to the background stars. <coughs> All right, we've passed it, so it appears to moving retrograde. And once we get all the way past, it will continue to move in the original path. 
All right, so here's how it would really look in the night sky. So here's the beehive cluster for just a comparison. Here comes Mars zooming across the sky. And it starts to wander backwards in its retrograde motion. You can see the date down in the lower right-hand corner. And then it will eventually move back, going in its prograde or normal motion. Okay, so look, this is from October 2009 to May 2010. All right, and there's a time-lapse image of Mars moving relative to the background star. So prograde motion, then retrograde motion, moving back westward, and then back eastward once again. All due to the fact that we surpass Mars in our orbit around our own sun. All right, so let's start off with the concept question with this. So during retrograde motion, so the key term there is retrograde motion, planets move blank relative to the background stars. So how do they move? A, eastward, B, westward, C, northward, or D, southward. So during retrograde motion, how do the planets move relative to the background stars? All right, so you all should have said westward. Because normally, okay, the planets appear to move relative to the background stars in an eastward direction. It's when they start to move back westward, that's what we call retrograde motion. When they finally begin to move back eastward again, that's direct motion, okay, the motion it normally takes. All right, so just for... Last clarification about this retrograde motion. It's how we see the planets moving in the night sky. So during one night, okay, you go outside and you observe the stars, the planets are going to move in accordance to the stars, right? Moving across the night sky from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. from east to west. But from night to night, week after week, month after month, the planets will move relative to the background stars. Okay, and they're going to move in a motion going eastward relative to the background stars or constellations. During retrograde motion, okay, when the Earth starts to move past that planet in its orbit, the planets will change direction night to night, and they'll start moving westward relative to the background stars. So the retrograde motion is the westward motion. The direct motion is moving back eastward. So that's retrograde motion. <clears throat> All right, so let's think a little bit more about the arrangement of the planets, okay? So this was after Copernicus's time, you know, after 1500. Um, really, we can still only see kind of the major planets, okay? But we now know that there's other planets out there, okay? So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Pluto is no longer considered a planet, and we'll talk about that later in the class, but do know your order of your planets from the Sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and then finally Neptune being the farthest from the Sun. Alright, so two groups of planets. Inferior planets. These are planets that have orbits smaller than the Earth's orbit. So planets between us and the Sun. Mercury and Venus are the only two inferior planets. They orbit closer to the Sun than the Earth. All the other planets are considered superior planets, not because they're better, but because they orbit outside of Earth's orbit. Their orbits are larger than the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So this is Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So your inferior planets orbit smaller than the Earth's orbit. Superior planets orbit farther out. Okay, so the position of the planets in the sky are going to depend on where they are in their orbit around the Sun, okay, relative to the Earth. So why they appear in these different parts of the sky, right? Well, it's all our orbital dynamics. Where we are relative to the sun, where the planet is relative to the sun. So inferior planets are going to go through cycles, right? Seen west after sunset for several weeks during the month. But then they're going to appear east before sunrise several weeks in the month. Okay, so inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, they're known as the morning or the evening planets, because we really see these planets as following the sun. The other planets we see as the nighttime planets. We can see them during the night. 
All right, so let's look at this. Bird's eye view of our solar system. Okay, your inferior planets being any of these planets inside Earth's orbit. Superior planets, whoops, excuse me, being any of the planets outside Earth's orbit. So notice that if the planet is between us and the sun, we are only going to be seeing those planets during the daytime or right after the sun has set. So Mercury and Venus are going to appear to us either early, early morning or right after sunset, okay, at dusk. The other planets, the outer planets here, okay, the superior planets, we are going to make people see these planets right after the sun set, see them at midnight and whatnot. We will see these in the evening skies, okay. Now, this term opposition, opposition just means when the planet is closest to Earth in its orbit. When opposition occurs, we are going to see the planet larger because literally we are closer to the planet, okay? Because that, that means that from our point of view, we're going to see a larger view of the planet. So this little image that's moving here in the lower right-hand corner is when Mars is at opposition with the Earth, meaning that we are closest to Mars in our orbit. So Mars literally appears bigger in terms of angular diameter in our night sky. Okay, so notice that the date's ticking here, July 2003, July um, through August 2003. This was the last time a very large opposition for Mars. So when we got really close and literally we were able to see a little bit more detail on Mars because we were closer to it. Okay, and that's an opposition. All right, I want to... Okay, so we're orbiting around the sun. Okay, the time it takes a planet to go around the sun is called a period. Okay, how long does it take a planet to complete one full orbit? That's a period. So there's two different periods, synodic period and sidereal period. Synodic period is the time that elapses between two successive identical configurations as seen from Earth. Okay, so this could be, for example, one opposition to the next. Okay, this is... Synodic period is an observation period, okay, from two configurations. So when Earth was going around the sun and we saw Mars get really big, right, near, op near opposition. So if we measure the time from one opposition to the next, that could be a synodic period. Okay, this time that elapses between two successive identical configurations as seen from Earth. Sidereal period is the calculated period, okay, the calculated time. It's the true orbital period, the time it takes to complete a full orbit around the sun. Okay, this is a calculated period, the full orbit around the sun, the 365 days. That's the sidereal period for Earth. Okay, it's the true orbital period. So the differences between those two periods. But remember, period is just how long it takes the planet to complete one full orbit. All right, so now that we have a good understanding of what a period is, this leads us into Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Okay, so Kepler, um, Johannes Kepler, he set out to describe how the planets moved in their orbits. His whole goal of his scientific research was to figure out how come we see these different occurrences. What is really happening in our solar system? How do the planets orbit the sun? Are they perfect circles? Are they ellipses? What's going on? So Kepler came up with three laws of planetary motion. Now the reason Kepler's laws are important is because they really describe the geometry and the physics of our solar system. He describes the solar system as we know it today. All right, so his three laws, I call them the law of ellipses, the law of equal areas, and then his third, the law of orbital harmony. All right, so Kepler's first law, the law of ellipses. Literally, his first law just says that the orbit of each planet in our solar system is in the shape of an ellipse, with the sun being at one focus. All right, so what is an ellipse? Well, an ellipse is almost a circle, but a little bit more oblate, okay? So most of the planets in our solar system do orbit close to being almost exactly a circle. Okay, so most planets are almost perfectly in a circular orbit, but not quite. And because they're not quite, they are literally considered an ellipse. Okay, so here's an ellipse. Okay, the sun being at one focus, there's nothing at the other focus. But the gravitational attraction of the planet around the sun is what keeps the planet in this orbit. Now, 
None of the planets orbit in quite this extreme looking of an ellipse, okay? So, most of the planets orbit close to being circular, okay? So, a perfectly circular ellipse would be a circle. Now, we can measure how elliptical an orbit is in terms of what's called eccentricity. So, eccentricity is just how elliptical an orbit is. So, an eccentricity of zero, little e being zero, would be a perfect circle. So, an orbit that has an eccentricity of zero would be a perfect circle with the sun at the center. All right. Now, a slightly more elliptical circle, an eccentricity of 0.5, Sun being at one, cir one focus would look something like this. An eccentricity of 0.9, you're getting even more elliptical. Eccentricity of 0.99, even more elliptical. Can you think of what an eccentricity of 1 might be? An eccentricity of 1 would literally be a straight line. Okay. So, the most circular, the planet with the most circular orbit is Venus. So Venus has closest to a circle. Okay, its orbit is closest to a circle. Venus has an eccentricity of 0 .007. Okay, so imagine between 0 and 0.5, Venus has an eccentricity of 0 .007. So it's pretty darn close to circular, but not quite. Mercury has an eccentricity of 0.2. Okay, so somewhere in between here. Earth has an eccentricity of 0 0.017, so 0 0.017, we're very close to circular, and our moon has an eccentricity of 0 0.05 around our own Earth. Okay, so most planets are pretty elliptical, okay, Venus being the most elliptical, or sorry, the most close, ah, sorry, I said this totally wrong, Venus has the orbit that is closest to being a circle, okay, with an eccentricity of 0 0.007. All right, Kepler's second law. So his first law literally says planets orbit in elliptical orbits. That's his first law. His second law talks about how the planets move around the sun. Okay, and he calls this the law of equal areas. Okay, was, but what I really want you to get out of this is that what's important about Kepler's second law is that because the orbits are elliptical, now this is an extreme elliptical shape, but it shows the point a bit better, when a planet is closest to the sun, it's feeling a very strong gravitational pull from our sun. When the planet is far in its orbit from the sun, it's feeling a weaker gravitational tug. So that means when the planet is close to the sun, the strong gravitational pull causes that planet to move faster around its orbit. Okay, it moves faster. Now, as it gets farther from the sun, because its orbit is elliptical, a lower gravitational pull causes the planet to move slower out here. So when the planet is close to the sun, it's moving faster. When the planet is far from the sun, it's moving slower. So what this means then is if you drew a line from the planet to the sun, it's going to sweep out equal areas in the orbit in equal time intervals. Okay, so meaning if the planet was close to the sun, from here, it moves along its orbit, sorry, to this point, it has swept out this area. Okay, so it moved quickly, so it moved a far distance. Now this area, though, is exactly equal to the area over here. Over here, the planet is far from the sun, so it's going to move a slower distance from here to here. Okay, a smaller distance, because it's moving slower. But because it's farther away, it actually ends up that it sweeps out the equal area in equals amounts of time. That's the official law. But what I want you to take away from this, okay, what I want you to think of when you think of Kepler's law, second law of motion, is that when a planet is close to the sun, it moves faster. When it's far from the sun, it moves slower. Okay, when it's close to the sun, we call this perihelion. So perihelion is when it's closest to the sun. When it's farthest from the sun, we call this aphelion, at the point when it's farthest from the sun. Now, all objects orbiting our sun move in this kind of motion. Okay, when, we, when you get close to the sun at perihelion, the object is moving fastest. When the object is far from the sun at aphelion, it's moving the slowest. All right. 
Kepler's third law of motion. I call it the law of orbital harmony. Okay. The third law relates the size of a planet's orbit and the time the planet takes to go once around the sun. So what we're looking at here is the orbital periods of the planets and their distances from the sun. And what we find is that the orbital periods are proportional to the distance they are from the sun. Okay, remember orbital period is just how long it takes a planet to orbit the sun. So we call that period, okay, that time, P, capital P here. We find that the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun is proportional to how far that planet is from the sun. Okay, the distance, d. And we find that it's in a proportion of the period squared and the distance cubed. You don't need to know this proportionality in terms of the squared and cubed for this class. But just understand that the period, how long it takes the planet to orbit the sun, is going to depend on how far away it is. Okay, so Mercury and Venus are very close to the sun, so they orbit the sun in very quick periods, okay, very quickly. The bigger planets that are farther out, like Jupiter and Saturn, they're, going, they're a lot farther from the sun, so they take a lot longer to orbit around the sun. Okay. This relation here, the period squared being equal to the distance cubed, is only true as long as the period is measured in years, Earth years, and the distance in astronomical units, okay, just for your own reference. But just understand, the closer the planet is to the sun, the faster it's going to orbit, the farther the planet is from the sun, the slower it's going to orbit. So the period being the time to orbit, and the distance being how far the planet is from the sun. That's his third law of motion. This link down here is Carl Sagan talking about Kepler's laws of motion. I encourage you to watch this video on your own, and just learn a little bit more about the history of Kepler and his laws of motion. Alright, so just the review. His three laws. The first law, planets orbit in elliptical orbits. Second law, planets move more quickly when they are close to the sun and they move slower as they are far from the sun. And the third law is that the orbital period of the planets are proportional to their distances from the sun. Okay, the closer the planet is, the faster it's going to move around the sun. The further from the sun, the slower. So we just talked about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, which really defined how we understand our solar system. Now, Galileo Galilei really advanced our understanding of the heavens above with his invention of the telescope. So Galileo, his first telescope was very small, but oh man, it showed him so much about the universe. Okay, So some of Galileo's largest discoveries were finding that Jupiter has four large moons, okay, huge discovery. He found out that the planets are circular disks, not just points of light, right? Like, when we look at the planets in the night sky, they look like stars. With the telescope, Galileo was actually able to see, hey, these are circular disks. They look like spheres almost, right? They look not just like the stars. Um, he also found out that Venus exhibits phases just like the moon does. Which, he, which meant that he was able to show that Venus does orbit the sun, okay, physical proof that Venus is orbiting the sun. He was able to see that the surface of the moon was not flat and smooth like they previously thought, but that instead it has lots of craters and mountains. And he was able to see sunspots on the sun, okay, dark regions that are at slightly lower temperatures on the sun, and we'll talk about sunspots when we talk about our sun. But really, Galileo's invention of the telescope just increased astronomical discoveries immensely. Helped, essentially, scientists like Newton and Kepler prove a lot of what they were theorizing about our solar system. Alright, so Kepler's three laws of motion really describe the planetary motion. Okay, Newton showed that Kepler's laws of planetary motion really just follow from some basic laws of motion that we think about as being laws of motion here on Earth. Okay, so Newton's laws of motion are for the physical world that we live in, and they were formed through experimental observation, and they apply to your everyday life. When you get up and you walk around, you are applying Newton's laws of motion, and Newton's laws of motion hold for the physical world that we live in. Okay, and they then are what Kepler 
builds on for Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So let's look at what these three basic laws of motion are that we experience every day. Newton's three laws of motion for the physical world. Okay, so I always like to bring up what force is because Newton's laws involve this term force. But I want to make sure we, we all understand what really is force. Okay, so before I dive into the laws of motion, what is force? So force is considered a push or a pull. It's an agent of change. So an object at rest will need some kind of force to get it moving. Okay, and, and a moving object needs a force to change the motion of that object, right? So if you're this rock climber up here in the upper right-hand corner, to move up the rock, you need to apply a force, okay? Some very common forms of force that we're probably familiar with are the force of friction. Okay, friction retards the motion of an object, okay, slows it down, for example. Friction is what allows this man to be climbing up the rock, right? The friction between the foot and the rock. Um, gravity is a force. It's a force that pulls downward. It's also the force of attraction between any two bodies in the universe. Okay, we think of the gravitational attraction mainly between planets and our sun. Okay, the sun has a gravitational force on the earth. The earth has a gravitational force on the moon. But there's also forces that are external, and there's also forces that are internal. Okay, there's internal forces that keep atomic particles together, that keep the atom together. Okay, those are internal forces. Um, external forces being like you pushing your book against the desk, okay, uh, implying a force against the force of friction, things like that. So with the force, okay, a force that we call a vector quantity, which is capable of producing motion or a change in motion. Okay, and a force has, lo and behold, units of newtons, okay, because Newton was the one to really come up with this, these ideas. But what I want to bring up for you guys is that forces can be balanced or canceled, okay, by one or more other force. So, for example, you probably have your textbook sitting next to you and it's sitting on your desk. It's not moving, okay, so the forces on your textbook right now are balanced. Your textbook is feeling a force of gravity pulling down, but the table is also pushing up on your textbook with a force, and so the force of the table pushing up is balancing the force pulling down on your textbook, okay. If the forces are not balanced, then motion occurs. Okay, so when forces are unbalanced, this is when a net force occurs. So if you have your book next to you, I want you to push your book against the table. All right, did the book move? If it moves, then you have a net force. You have broken the balance of force. In this case, you are overcoming the force of friction of your book against the table. Okay, so a good example of force balance is tug of war. On the top image here, Okay, you have balanced forces because both sides are equally pulling on the rope. Okay, force one in this direction is equal to force two. There's no motion. But as soon as the balance of forces is unequal, okay, you have unbalanced forces, there's a net force. In this case, the net force is to the right. Okay, these people are having a stronger force, so they will cause motion, causing these people to topple over, right? So, a net force will cause a motion. Alright, so now that we understand force a little bit better, let's talk about Newton's laws of motion. Okay, so Newton's first law of motion, often just referred to as the law of inertia. So, an object is going to remain at rest, or an object in motion is going to remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Okay, meaning, the book is going to sit there, and it's going to sit there forever unless a force acts on that book, an outside force, like your hand pushing it, okay? Also, if there were no other forces, okay, let's imagine like a hockey puck sliding on some ice, which is a very low friction surface. You slide that hockey puck, it's going to keep moving forever and ever and ever, if, assuming there's no force of friction, okay? But there is a force of friction. Friction is an outside force, so eventually that hockey puck will slow down and stop moving, okay? But in general, an object in motion will stay in motion, or an object at rest will stay at rest unless some other force acts on it, okay? This law is also referred to as a law of inertia. Inertia, by definition, is the resistance to change in motion, okay? Mass is actually a measure of inertia. The greater the mass, the greater the inertia or the greater the resistance to change. 
Okay, I love this little image here. Inertia, you lose. Okay, so what's happening in this image here, right? You're riding on your bike. You and your bike are both moving. Your object's in motion. You're going to stay in motion unless acted upon on an outside force. You jam on the brakes. Your bike stops. But guess what? You keep moving because you were moving at the same speed of your bike and there's nothing to stop you. So what do you do? You topple over your handlebars. That darn inertia. Okay. So this is Newton's first law. So imagine objects in space, in the vacuum of space. There's no resistance forces. So that means if you have, like, let's say, a football and you toss it out into space, okay, there's no air resistance. There's no forces of air resistance to pull that ball. There's no gravity to force that ball down to Earth. Instead, that football will just keep moving and spinning out in space forever and ever until it's acted upon by an outside force, which could be when it gets next to a big star or another planet that is going to pull on that football gravitationally. But if not, it will keep moving because there's no other forces to change its motion. So that's Newton's first law of motion. So some great real-world examples of Newton's first law of motion are your seat belt and then, of course, in space. Okay, so your seat belt is a great example of inertia. Okay, so imagine you're driving in your car and you slam on the brakes. What happens? Well, you keep moving, right? Because you are moving at the same speed of your car. The car stops, but you, because of inertia, are going to keep moving. So that's where seat belts come in. Seat belts stop your motion. They provide an outside force on your body to hold you back. All right, so let's look at these examples of inertia in terms of why you should definitely wear your seatbelt. Okay, it's looking at crash test dummies. All right, so here you are. No seatbelt. The car stops. You keep moving forward due to the law of inertia. An object in motion will continue in motion. It hits the steering wheel. That's the outside first, the outside force breaking your bones. All right, now here you have a seatbelt. The seatbelt and the... Um, airbag stop your motion it provides a more comfortable outside force to stop your body overcoming inertia all right so seat belt no seat belt unless you want to be a victim of inertia you should definitely wear your seat belt all right another great example is objects and moving um, objects will keep moving at a constant speed in space because there's nothing to stop their motion. There's no outside force. So this is a great example of an astronaut losing the tool bag when trying to fix, um, I think actually out in the space station. Let's take a look at this. International Space Station. She grabs the tool bag. Whoop! She let go of it. There's nothing to stop the motion. It keeps flying Oh, great. Um, we have a lot of tools. Yeah. I guess the, uh, or at least one of my, or you the cool upside was not transferred in this loop. There it goes, way back here. Look at the same way. Hey, Heidi, crew lock back. There it is, floating away. You see it? Yeah, we see it. Nothing to stop the motions. So the tool bag just keeps floating. And of course, she doesn't want to jump after it unless she's tethered down because then she'll keep moving. Uh All right, so that darn inertia getting the best of the astronauts. Okay. She gives the tool bag a force, but there's nothing to impede the force, so it's going to keep moving unless acted upon by an outside force. All right, and just for fun, can't do this. Okay, I love Calvin and Hobbes, so he's asked to explain Newton's first law of motion. You know, I always say in your own words, but don't make up your own language. All right, it's a fun little, little comic strip in there. All right, Newton's second law of motion. His second law of motion describes how the motion of an object changes when there is an outside force acting on it. Okay, so mathematically, Newton's second law says force is equal to mass times acceleration. F equals ma. What does this really mean? Okay, so for a body of constant mass, the larger the net external force, the larger the acceleration. Okay, so the more force you put on something, the larger the acceleration can be. It also says that a body undergoing a constant acceleration, the larger the mass of that body, the larger the net force is needed to get that body moving. Okay, so 
The second law describes how motion changes if there's a net force acting on it. All right, Newton's third law of motion. It's all about symmetry. Okay, the natural world is full of symmetry. Okay, Newton's law, I really think of it just a simple statement of symmetry. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, imagine you blow up a balloon, right? You let it go. What happens? Air rushes out one end, the balloon moves the other way. Okay, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, that second object exerts a force in an equal and opposite force on the first object. Okay? A great example of Newton's third law is the recoil on a gun. Okay, you fire a gun, the bullet is moving outward in one direction, but if you have that gun against your shoulder, right, it pops your shoulder back. Okay, that's the equal and opposite force. Now they put different devices and guns to absorb that shock, otherwise, yeah, that hurts your shoulder pretty bad. Okay, because it's the exact same force that's pushing the bullet out, is pushing the gun back into your shoulder. Okay, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the force exerted by one object is the exact force exerted on the other. Imagine this. You lean against a wall. Okay, you're pushing on the wall with a certain amount of force. You don't fly through the wall, right? That's because the wall is pushing on you with an equal force, but in the other direction, back on your hand. Okay, otherwise, if it wasn't, you'd fall through the wall. So as long as it's holding you up, okay, the wall is pushing back on you with an exact amount of force. And that's Newton's third law of motion. Now, Newton really has a, a fourth law. It's called the law of universal gravitation. It really comes really important in astronomy. Okay, what his universal law of gravitation says is that every body in the universe attracts every other body with a force that is directly proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Every body in the universe, every planet, every moon, every star, you, me, your computer, your book, every object exerts a gravitational force on every other object. The Earth has a gravitational force on the Moon. The Sun has a gravitational force on the Earth. The Earth has a gravitational force on you. And believe it or not, you have a gravitational force on all the objects around you. Now, in general, the gravitational attraction between you and the lamp next to you or your computer in front of you are very weak compared to the gravitational force the Earth pulls down on you and compared to the gravitational force that the Sun pulls on the Earth. But it does exist, because all it takes for this universal force of gravitation is for two masses, and for those masses to have a distance between them. So what I want you to understand from the universal law of gravitation is that a gravitational force exists between all objects, and that this gravitational force decreases with distance, okay? The sun has a very strong gravitational force on the Earth. But the sun also has a gravitational force on a comet way out in the, so in the outer edges of the solar system. But the force that the sun has on the earth is much stronger because the earth is closer to the sun. The force of gravity that the sun has on this comet is very weak compared to the force it has on the earth because the comet is very far away. Okay, so the gravitational force decreases with distance. Also, the greater the mass of the object, the greater the gravitational force. So the sun is very, very massive. So its gravitational force is very, very strong. Okay? So your computer has a gravitational force to you, but neither of you are very massive compared to the Earth. Okay? So mass and distance come into play here. Now, this universal law of gravitation brings us into Kepler's laws of motion because it's all about the orbit, the reason planets have these elliptical orbits, the reason that they move faster around the sun as they get closer is all due to Newton's law of gravitation. Okay, so imagine Newton's law of gravitation is what keeps our moon in orbit. It's what allows satellites to orbit the Earth. And it's also what causes all objects to fall down towards the Earth. Okay, so objects, if they start moving fast around the planet Earth, they can get into what we call orbit. Okay, so 
Imagine if you just dropped an apple, it's going to fall straight to earth. But now let's say you give that apple some velocity. You throw it horizontally. It's going to arc for a while horizontally, and then gravity will eventually win. But let's say you get higher up off the earth, further from the earth. That gravitational pull is going to be a little bit less because you get further from the earth. That distance gets greater. You give that object some velocity, and eventually that object will continue in an orbit. It's always being pulled down by gravity, but it has enough inertial motion in this direction to keep it in its orbit. And that's exactly what's happening with the moon. Okay, it's constantly falling to the earth, but it's just far enough from the Earth that it's not going to fall down onto the Earth, but it keeps in orbit. So that's combining Newton's law of gravitation with Kepler's laws of motion. Now we see these gravitational forces in one big way on Earth, and that's the tides. Okay, the tides are a result of gravitational forces between the Moon and the Earth and the Sun. Okay, the Moon is closer to the Earth. So the moon is going to have more of an effect on our tides than the sun, but the sun does come into play, okay, because it's more massive, because it's mass and distance that come into play with gravitational forces. So the earth rotates essentially underneath the oceans, okay? The oceans are this fluid body that can be manipulated more easily by a gravitational tug. So when the moon is tugging on the earth's oceans, the oceans literally bulge because they are being gravitationally pulled towards the moon. And that's when we experience our high and our low tides, depending on where you are on the earth. Now sometimes the earth and the moon will be on opposite sides of the earth. Both bodies are pulling on the oceans, causing these elongated tidal effects. But if the earth and the moon are at 90 degrees towards one another, you get these kind of deep tides, okay, where there's little deformation, little distortion in the tides because both planetary objects are pulling on the tides, but they're not on opposite sides of the Earth, so you're getting less of a tidal pull. The only reason the Earth experienced tides is because the oceans aren't clung down to the Earth. Okay, They're able to be manipulated, and they're being manipulated by the gravitational tug of the Moon and of the Sun. Okay, So tides are a result of Newton's laws and Kepler's laws all due to the universal force of gravitation. All right, let's watch this short video on um, essentially Kepler's and Newton's laws. And how they apply to space flight and orbital mechanics. So we're going to watch the whole thing. We're just going to watch about five minutes or so of it. You also have the link on the PowerPoint presentation if you want to watch this on your own as well. When ancient man looked to the heavens for guidance from the gods, he noticed star patterns and began to document their movement across the heavens. The ancients believed that the earth was flat, but around 350 BC, Aristotle proved that the earth was round. Later, about 150 A.D., Ptolemy presented the geocentric theory, the belief that the Earth is stationary at the center of the universe, with the sun, moon, stars, and planets revolving around it in complex orbits. In the 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus of Poland presented the heliocentric theory, the belief that the Earth revolves around the sun as it rotates on its axis. This aspect of astronomy evolved into an intricate study of planetary motion known as orbital mechanics. Today, orbital mechanics is applied to space flight and satellites that orbit the Earth or travel beyond our solar system. In the early 1600s, 
Johann Kepler, a German mathematician, using the data on planetary observations collected by the Danish scientist Tycho Brahe, developed three laws of planetary motion. Kepler's first law states, All planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus and the other focus empty. Applied to Earth satellites, the center of the Earth becomes one focus with the other focus empty. For circular orbits, the two foci coincide. Kepler's second law, the law of areas, states, The line joining the planet to the sun sweeps over equal areas in equal time intervals. When a satellite orbits, the line joining it to the Earth sweeps over equal areas in equal periods of time. If areas 1, 2, and 3 are equal, times 1, 2, and 3 are also equal. Therefore, the speed of the satellite changes depending on its distance from the center of the Earth. Speed is greatest at the point in the orbit closest to the Earth, called perigee, and is slowest at the point farthest from the Earth, called apogee. It is important to note that the orbit followed by a satellite is not dependent on its mass. A large, heavy satellite could be in the same orbit with a small, light one, each sweeping out equal areas in equal periods of time. Kepler's third law, the law of periods, relates the time required for a planet to make one complete trip around the sun to its mean distance from the sun. For any planet, the square of its period of revolution is directly proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. Applied to Earth satellites, Kepler's third law explains that the farther a satellite is from the Earth, the longer it will take to complete an orbit, the greater the distance it will travel to complete an orbit, and the slower its average speed will be. Isaac Newton, the father of classical mechanics, laid the groundwork for orbital mechanics. He combined the work of Kepler and others to formulate the law of universal gravitation and the three Newtonian laws of motion. While Kepler's laws provided a conceptual model of orbital motion, Newton's laws provided the foundation for the mathematical description of orbits. They explain why a satellite stays in orbit. Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Any two objects in the universe, such as the Earth and the Moon, attract each other with a force directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Stated more simply, the more massive the objects are, or the closer they are, the greater the gravitational pull between them. Newton's first law of motion. A body in motion will keep moving at the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an external force. A satellite moves in a curved path around the Earth because the Earth's gravitational pull acts as an external force on it. Newton's second law of motion. If the sum of the forces acting on an object is not zero, the object will have an acceleration proportional to the magnitude and in the direction of the net force. Newton's second law states that force equals mass times acceleration. It is this mathematical equation and the equation for universal gravitation that forms the basis for calculating orbits. 
Newton's third law of motion explains how a satellite gets into orbit. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you blow up a balloon and let it go, the balloon is pushed forward by the action of the air rushing out of it. A rocket's exhaust gases are like the air rushing out of the balloon. The following illustrates how a satellite stays in orbit. If a man stands on a mountain and fires a projectile horizontally, gravity will cause the path of the projectile to curve downward and it will strike the earth. However, if the man fires the projectile fast enough at a specific speed, the curvature of its path due to gravity will match the curvature of the earth under it. The projectile will then fall around the earth, becoming an earth-orbiting satellite. A projectile fired even faster will have a flight path away from the earth, but gravity will act to slow the projectile down, change its flight path, and pull it back toward earth. If the projectile's velocity increased enough, a velocity sufficient to escape the Earth's gravitational pull will be reached. This velocity is known as the escape velocity. It is equal to about seven miles per second at the Earth's surface. The preceding description did not consider atmospheric drag and the Earth's rotation, both of which will affect the trajectory of the projectile. It illustrated the principles governing a satellite's orbit. So that was a great example. So in that video, we were analyzing, we were using Kepler's laws and Newton's laws to understand how satellites orbit the Earth. The same laws and descriptions apply to the moon orbiting the Earth, the Earth orbiting the sun, any bodies orbiting other bodies in the universe. Okay, these, these laws are universal. So hopefully that was a good overview of the chapter so far. Just want to let you know that next Tuesday, February 5th, we will have our second pop quiz, pop quiz number two, that will be taken right at the beginning of class on Blackboard. So be ready for that. This pop quiz will cover um, mainly questions from chapter three and chapter four to make sure you're ready for those for your exam. Um, here's your homework. It's also posted on Blackboard. But just in case you want to look at it now, this is homework covering chapter three the end of lunar phases and eclipses, and then what we covered here in this lecture, chapter four, on the history of astronomy. So make sure you complete this homework. It is also due February 5th. And then finally, just a heads up, your first exam is a week from this Thursday. So your first exam will occur on Thursday, February 7th. It'll be taken, um, you'll have the entire day actually available to you, but you'll have a time limit of an hour and 30 minutes. This exam will be taken on Blackboard. It will have multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank, and essay type questions. It is an open note, open book, but does that, not, that does not mean you should not study because there is a time limit. The exam is, will be written so that you are not meant to go look up the answers in the, in the textbook. That is not the idea. You want to study for this exam as if it were closed note and closed book. So do not um, depend on your book or your notes too heavily for this exam. You must take the exam alone. There is no talking or chatting with anyone else and no internet research is allowed. Okay, it all needs to come from your own brain and you need to um, study because the time limit does not allow you to have time to go look up every answer. That is not the idea. I want to know what's in your head. All right? And I'll announce more about this exam on next Tuesday, but I just want to give you a head up, heads up that this first exam is February 7th. All right, and that's it for Chapter 4. Get through your reading, and I will see you guys all next Tuesday, um, and I'll be lecturing to you from Japan. All right, have a great weekend, and email me with any questions or Skype me if you want to have office hour chat with me. All right, take care, everyone.